Hello guys, welcome to my next Monday Bagel episode. My guest uh, today is Professor Daniel Schwartz uh, from University of Minnesota, author of fantastic paper about lawyering in the modern age, lawyering in the age of artificial intelligence. Daniel, it's great you could join me. I'm thrilled to be here. I would like to discuss matters uh, you described because you write about the things many people have intuition about uh, and you have the data. So can you start by giving us an overview of your study? What was it about uh, uh, and what what it explores? Yeah, absolutely. And I might just even uh, go back a little bit further. So, you know, you're you're absolutely right that obviously there's been a lot of hype in the space of AI and law, um, AI, pretty much anything, but particularly in law. And so going back to when ChatGPT was first introduced, I started working on trying to actually empirically measure to better understand how AI would affect lawyering. And the first sort of study I did was just to look at how AI um, affected law students' performance on exams. And what we've done over time is a series of papers looking at, with more and more sophistication on the impact of AI. And so that we first looked at law school exams just using ChatGPT. Then we looked at how does uh, providing actual law students with access to GPT-4 impact their performance on exams? How does better prompting affect performance on exams? And this latest paper that you mentioned, Lawyering in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, is the most important of the research that we've done. Because what we do in this exam is really try to replicate as best we can in experimental setting how AI affects lawyering. And so to lay out the very basics of the paper, what we do is we select four basic lawyering tasks, drafting a legal memo, drafting a contract, drafting a complaint to initiate a lawsuit, and updating an employee handbook. And we uh, recruited 60 law students to perform these tasks, and we varied uh, whether or not the law students had access to GPT-4 to assist them with these tasks. We also provided them with an hour or two of training beforehand on how to use the AI. And our basic results, uh, when we actually looked at how did the students who had access to AI perform relative to those who didn't, was that in the aggregate, quality wasn't substantially affected by access to AI, but speed was very dramatically affected. And that students who had access to the AI were able to produce somewhere between, depending on the task, 20 to 30% faster work product without any uh, decrease in the quality. And I think that in some ways it's not at all surprising. It reflects folks' intuition. But on the other hand, um, we think it's important to establish that empirically. And we also think that it's very clear that this is sort of a very much a lower bound estimate uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we weren't using legal focused AI. We were just using GPT-4. We were just dealing with students who had one hour of training with these um, activities. And so we think that you know over time, the what, what this suggests is that the speed gains on a variety of activities will be much higher than 30, the 30 to 40% that we were measuring now. Um, uh, but we think that that provides sort of a good baseline to start thinking about uh, uh, the effects that AI is going to have on the legal sphere sort of now and in the near term future. Uh, so impact on the speed is clear, but what about effect on quality? Why was it not improved? What's your opinion about it? Yeah, so what we found was that average quality wasn't improved in a statistically significant way, but there was variation there. In some spaces, there was actually a very slight decline. In other spaces, there was an improvement in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. But what we found is that if you look behind the aggregate numbers and you look at the individuals, um, you actually did see pretty significant quality improvements among the lower performing students. It was the students who did well even without AI who didn't really see an improvement with AI. And in a prior paper, we actually found that there was a decrease in quality among those very high performing students when we gave them access to AI. So, so the question is, what's behind this? I mean, I think there are a lot of answers to that. So one, we were lim using limited AI, right? Just general purpose AI. Two, the tasks varied, and some of the tasks law students were already optimized on, others they weren't. Um, three, you know, I think that it takes a lot of training and understanding to be able to actually use AI to improve the quality of your work product. 
And I think that for some folks, at least at first, it can harm the quality because you have to integrate material and it can either narrow your sort of frame of reference, you know, um, um, it can cause you to sort of uh, lose the sort of brainstorming element that you might have when you first encounter a legal problem. Uh, it can cause you to narrow in on the issues that the AI has focused on. It can create organizational problems. Mm -hmm. You're trying to sort of copy and paste pieces of what the AI said with pieces of your own analysis. Um, so I think it's a tricky task, at least in certain contexts, to use the AI to actually improve quality. So I think all of those are factors. The basic bottom line is if you've already got law students who are pretty highly optimized to perform certain tasks, AI is not going to help too much, at least in the context of the way we studied it. What about uh, participants' perception of AI? Did it change after the project uh, and how it can affect their professional lives, do you, do you think? Yeah, that was one really interesting element of the study. So we did, do, we did survey participants afterwards to understand what their experience was like. Uh, most of them had no real prior experience using AI at all, uh, much less using AI for purposes of, you know, producing legal work product. And we found that there was substantial, not only enthusiasm for using AI, but that increased over the course of the experiment. So as students had two assignments where they used AI and two assignments where they didn't, they themselves reported that it produced increased satisfaction, that they felt that their capacity to use the AI effectively improved. Um, and that they would be more likely after the experiment than they were before to explore ways to use AI in their future practice. And so I think the bottom line finding on research participants' subjective experience uh, from using AI was, was very enthusiastic and um, suggestive that uh, once you start using it, and once you at least put in sort of a baseline amount of effort, it promotes a lot of enthusiasm for the tool. Extremely interesting are the implications you see and predict. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that part? Because you see both normative and professional uh, implications on legal profession and on legal education. Yeah, absolutely. So anyone who started really focusing in on AI and the law, I think, understands that AI is going to have a, a broad ranging effects across the, the, the legal domain, including law schools, law students, law firms, clients. Mm -hmm. and so what we do is we sort of try to break that down a bit. And so when it comes to lawyers and judges, I think the basic message is act fast because there's going to be real competitive advantages to embracing this technology and so uh, uh while there are certainly risks and you know we uh, we certainly don't want to downplay those those risks um given that we're already seeing in our very simple setup with non-tailored ai um with folks who aren't really trained on it uh, uh, there can be significant improvements in just a, a lawyer's or law firm's capacity uh, by using AI. And that just means, you know, whether you, you use that increased capacity uh, uh, to, you know, do extra work for a client, to research additional issues, to draft additional terms, or just to charge clients less, um, there's a tremendous amount of competitive pressure that is going to develop Given how powerful the tool is, I think it's actually very important that early on law schools limit the ability of law students to access these tools so that law students to develop the, um, the basic foundational skills um, of lawyering. I think there's a real danger that if you allow students to have these tools early on, that provides a crutch to weaker students. It also... Um, uh, provides a way for, you know, displaces sort of higher order thinking. And so you never actually develop that among, um, among introductory students. So, you know, to be really concrete about that, right, like my first year law students, I don't allow them to use AI at all. I don't mm -hmm. really spend time talking to them about AI, except sort of in very general terms, because I think they need to learn the basics before they learn to use AI. And I think the analogy that I've heard others make is that when you're learning math, you first learn how to, you know, add and subtract and divide and multiply without a calculator. And then once you can do those things, then you use a calculator. And so 
consistent with that, right? Once you get into higher order math, right, you're taught how to use a calculator and you're actually taught not just, you know, how to add and subtract with a calculator, but you're taught how to use a graphing calculator. You're taught how to uh, 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 use, uh, you know, do basic programming. Um, and so similarly, I think law schools have to ad adapt a model where in their upper, you know, in the later years after the basic training is complete, there's a real competency to teach students how to use these tools. But I think, again, if law students are going to be competitive, they're going to need these skills, which means if law schools are going to be competitive, they're going to need to train law students in this way. So, and then the final sort of, you know, set of folks that we look at are clients, um, folks who are hiring law firms, who are hiring lawyers. And I think, uh, you know, they really need to be asking questions from their external counsel about how do we want to allocate the efficiency gains associated with this new technology? Um, do we want law firms to be charging the same amount of money but doing more, which mm -hmm. is what law firms want to do? And what you often hear from them is, oh, well, we have tons to do. We don't need, you know, we need to build just as many hours, but we need to research these additional issues or we need, we are now finally free to do these additional things or to clients actually, are they satisfied with the quality they've been getting all along and would they rather just take the, the price cut? And I think, I think that there, there are real questions there because at the end of the day, even though attorneys are, you know, fiduciaries of their clients, they also face conflicts of interest. They, they want to build time. And I think if clients don't ask themselves the question of whether that, you know, given the baseline we had before AI, and given that AI already is capable of producing, you know, 30, 40% increases in speed, just based on sort of simple techniques, that should be, mean either you get the same quality for 30 or 40% fewer hours built, or you pay the same amount and you get much higher quality. So I think it's a pretty broad ranging set of implications, depending on which subset of the uh, legal ecosystem one focuses on. Yeah, extremely interesting. I fully agree. When I was discussing this matter with lawyers, they are pretty concerned what happens because hourly billing model is everywhere, in, in especially in the US. So it's a really risky for this model. My final question, what advice would you give to current and future legal professionals about uh, embracing AI tools in, in their practice? I think experimentation is key. And, and, and thinking of it as a skill to develop over time. The, the folks who are most skeptical of this technology, they try it once and they think, oh, well, this produces a crappy result. Or they hear a story in the New York Times about the lawyer who you know, had a chat GPT make up some cases. And they think, oh, look at that, it just makes up cases. This is a completely useless tool. And I think that's a real mistake. I think that you need to look at this as like any tool, it has certain risks, of course. Um, there are risks associated with fabricating you know, information, so the information needs to be checked, and there are a variety of ways to do that. But at the end of the day, as you use it, the tool, you can get better. I think it's experimenting with different tools, and we're seeing so much innovation right now. I mean, Lexus, I think, literally, maybe today or yesterday, just uh, launched their or, or expanded the domain of folks who have access to their uh, service. Uh, Westlaw is in the process of of integrating AI into its service. Um, there are, you know, hundreds of startups um, uh, in the space that that are exploring all sorts of different uh, paths. I personally am somewhat bullish on the idea of fine tuning uh, models based on you know firm specific um, uh, information, but but others are less so. And you know, there are, there are a bunch of startups out there and. It, that are exploring that pathway. Um, and then of course, there's just so much um, innovation happening in AI generally that's not even connected to law. The landscape is changing so quickly that I think it's gonna have to be um, thought of as you know, probably one of the core competencies that pretty much any lawyer is gonna need to develop over the coming, I would say years. But obviously, uh, th there's also a tremendous amount of uncertainty on, on, on this in terms of how the technology is going to evolve. 
Um, I agree. I, I'm looking also forward to use of artificial intelligence in legal profession, but I'm also a bit scared uh, what happens. You guys experiment, as Daniel uh, said, and read uh, lawyering in the age of artificial intelligence, which gives uh, uh, some more numbers, some more details, some more implications that we were able to discuss in, in this episode. Uh, Daniel, thank you for inspiring uh, discussion, uh, for all these uh, data and information you, you revealed. Uh, it was great. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me.